Uh, hi. Thanks, Mark and Eldridge and, and David for round two. This is great. Um, so this paper uh, was co-written with Bethany Ides. Hey, I think she's watching. Uh, she couldn't be here today. Um, so just so you know that it's not me who's solely responsible for this. Also, I don't know how many of you have done collaborative writing before and felt the pressure to become one seamless voice. That, that can be really fun because it's often fun to try and figure out who wrote what later on. Um, Bethany and I don't really have that problem. <laughs> we write very differently and we're also trying to figure out how to let each other have space. So there are parts of this that might be completely disjunctive and strange and that's how it is. 5,040, or the number of people a full-voiced orator can comfortably address, writes Plato, apparently. We've never been able to track down this quotation, so we'll have to take the composer Armory Schaefer at his word, who we can only guess seems to have taken Lewis Mumford at his word. Community, insofar as it is produced and bounded acoustically, is limited by the reach of the voice as it travels, unmediated through space. Community, writes Schaefer, can be defined in many ways as a political, geographical, or social entity, but the ideal community may also be defined advantageously along acoustic lines, end quote. We might also turn, for example, to Goethe's Weimar, a settlement of six or 700 houses, each of which was within earshot of the half-blind night watchman. We once knew where we stood, say Schaefer and Alain Corbin, by, drawing within, by dwelling within the sonic circles that parish church bells traced across the land. But in the time of transnational communication, of telepresence and Skype, the dream of being together in a sound whose one true origin is present in the present is easily dismissed as a nostalgic fantasy. But this does not mean that sound has lost its power to constitute community. Indeed, the modern nation state, birthed in no small part thanks to mechanical and electronic media of the 19th century, deploys sound as a means of creating and strengthening affective ties to the homeland. National anthems and patriotic pop songs carried across wires and borne through public address systems can engender an immediate or imaginary affiliation to a group of people, a unisonance. Sardonically, Benedict Anderson writes, quote, how selfless this unisonance feels if we are aware that others are singing these songs precisely when and as we are, we have no idea who they may be or even where, out of earshot, they are singing. Nothing connects us all but imagined sound. Even at a distance, we are meant to imagine ourselves bound together through love, love of country, love of the other, but this love is a strange love, a music for the masses that massifies and breeds community under the sign of identification. So, we ask, how are we to channel sonic energies to form alliances and communities in our digital present, to foster a love that doesn't melt the subject into the mold of an expe expedient political identity? How might we synthesize, synthesize resilient communities that operate at, varieties of frequency, at a variety of frequencies in a multiplicity of registers? For us, love has a special resonance, one that follows from Michael Hart's recent call to rethink and do politics through an erotics of engagement. Simple, no? What could be more unproblematic than love? Mm -hmm. Peace and love, love one's neighbors, one loves oneself, one love, let's get together, etc. Of course, we all know that love is never so simple. As Hart reminds us, love can be both destructive and smothering, revolutionary, revolutionary and desperately conservative. One falls in love as though tumbling into, pit, into a pit at whose bottom one is dashed to pieces and from which one reemerges re remade. This love shatters time and, uh, and so that there is uh, so that there's no, no longer such a thing as time outside of love. But isn't falling different from being in love, residing in the, in the stability of an eternal bond? Yes, it's very different, but this love is held breath and never letting go. It denies time for the terror that love will change, fade, or be lost. The two extremes of love, one volatile and explosive, the other clinging and oblivious. What Hart suggests we seek is, quote, a love that is in time, a love that has both the transformative powers of the event and the duration of the bond. Love. Whatever. <laughs> yes, whatever. No, not whatever. I don't care, although, of course, you really do. It does not matter, quote, it does not matter which, indifferently, end quote. Giorgio Agamben's whatever being, a singularity of whatever that designates nothing less than singularity itself, not a singularity that designates something or someone's having a particular characteristic or send entities belonging to a set, but that this exemplifies nothing more or less than being, quote, being such for belonging itself, end quote. 
Agamemnon's writing on whatever being, trans translated not so inciden incidentally by Michael Hart, is very much about love. Love, writes Agamemnon, is never directed towards this or that property of the loved one, being blonde, being small, being tender, being lame. But neither does, this, does it neglect the properties in favor of an insipid generality, universal love. The lover wants the loved one with all of its predicates, its being such as it is, end quote. I want you. I want all of you. I want all of your predicates. I want all of you, your singularity singularly, and I desire your multiplicity multiply. But the force of my desire so quickly melts at you into a type, a trope, a symbol, when we give ourselves over to so powerful a desire so that love consumes us and precipitates a falling into that melts and melds a form of what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism. This is the bind that lovers feel when love has failed. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I thought it was a quote, it's not. Also, please, I have no idea what, how much time there is or when I started, so if somebody can just wave at me. That'd be great, thanks. Um, this is the bind that lovers feel when love has failed, when it's no more than a promise of love that sustains it, Quote, where cruel optimism operates, the very vitalizing or animating potency of an object scene of desire contributes to the attrition of the very thriving that is supposed to be made possible in the work of attachment in the first place, end quote. Drawing from Barbara Johnson's Poetics of Indirection, Berlant describes a situation of closeness and distance that would seem to defy spatial logic. Quote, the condition of a projected possibility of a hearing that cannot take place in terms of its enunciation you are not here, you are eternally belated to the conversation with you that I'm imagining, creates a fake moment of intersubjectivity in which nonetheless a performance of address can take place, end quote. This quote, reaching out to you, is actually a turning back, end quote. And the spatial temporal confusion of mixed here and there-ness could be imagined as a lover suddenly spotlit by a belief and recognition that the light illuminating her beloved has lit in order to be recognized by her the cruel trick of a trigger switch, that it must be attached to something, and that something is the lover's own desire. Singular, yet the love contains multitudes. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with us. Even so, the body is not made up of one, but of many. Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. I writhe for it. Because I am not an eye, even as I am apart from the body, I see you writhing. And because I'm not a wound, even as I enter a body, I enter, you, I enter how you enter me. Whatever I'm, whatever, whenever I am not a polis, even though I'm not a polis, I picture, it in this, I picture it this being inside you. I am persistently, I am insisting on this opposition to any history that documents the polis, even as the body that creates a body mid-procreatively is moaning. <coughs> Breathe. Whatever. Yet, like Hart, we are not only speaking here of individual bodies, but of ways of organizing communities, groups, societies. We're trying to think of ways of constituting communities that reside in constant upheaval while providing a significant foundation upon which people might build lives and live well, and yes, love. The point is we cannot know in advance what these communities will or should feel like, look like, or sound like. There's always the danger that they will be governed by the habit to congregate towards the similar or strive towards a forced, contrived notion of difference. This is what is so terrifying about a politics of love. Hart writes, quote, we can never know in advance what multiplicities will agree and together form beautiful lasting relationships. The, procedures of, the procedure of love is to explore and experiment with possible compositions among the multiplicities in each of us. So what does love sound like, you ask? We're tentative here, speculative, as we've been trained to listen critically, full of judgment, and are quick to, act, to label unpleasant sounds noise as, so as to dismiss or abate them. We might start with the idea of composition, to which Hart alludes. When he describes love as a gathering together of new encounters and multiplicities, <clears throat> the way that composition, bring, quote, brings together sometimes disparate motifs and materials in ways that create a dynamic work, end quote. We laud his, faithful, his faith in the redemptive power of music, but we would qualify that even the most disparate motifs can be fused into forms that foment totalitarianism, totalitarianism and oppression. We would point out that there's no good ontology of composition, only loving applications of organized or disorganized sound, a politics of praxis or doing, a constantly recalibrated disfiguring and reconfiguring of the polis. Or toward a phenomenology of composition, Gertrude Stein explains, quote, the continuous present explanatorily. The composition is the thing seen by everyone 
in the living thing they are doing. They are the composing of the composition that at the time they are the living in the composition of the time in which they are living. It is that they, it is that, is that that makes a living thing they are doing, end quote. It is the marking of difference that makes the moment, or as she writes in Tender Buttons, quote, a line just distinguishes it, end quote. So that the operation of difference describes what it's doing as it's doing it, a heterosonance in which the notes and rests might flicker in response to one another diz dizzyingly, as if viewing with unfettered attention both the faces and the vase in the il illusional illustration. Or as Stein herself puts it in the same essay, and, uh, quote, there's almost not an interval, end quote. Likewise, the makeup of such a Steinian sounding community we can imagine would be aptly determinable only in, the de in detecting the motions of its fluctuation, as again in Tender Buttons, the difference is speaking. Jacques Attali optimistically imagined a coming community liberated by sonic practice, one that presages an imminent utopia in which subjects are liberated from having to consume and therefore are free to create. A few decades on, of course, we are jaded and doubtful that this will ever come to pass. However, it's worth pointing out that the erotics of, involved in such a proposition are not either so vain or as rosy as the shimmering Hollywood ones we and Hart would resent. Rather, it has a lick of optimistic cruelty, one might say. It's predicated on conditions that would assume a certain stance of relative freedom. For instance, the freedom, for instance, the freedom to select and manage and even form a kind of intimate relationship with a recording. Here we find similarity with the story of O, a classic of subversive literature that offers much in terms of strategies of subversion, or at least methods for conceiving of tricky political swerves, neither ideological nor non-participative. Here Pauline Réage imparts on behalf of a radically formless anti-protagonist O, that it is only when nothing is expected in return can a lover be sure that the fullest, most uncountable amounts of her resources should undergo total and, therefore trans and thereby transformative seizure. A claim beyond claims, unfettered desire. For, all, for having all and wanting yet is freedom. Giving all and being all, and uh, giving all and being wanted is freedom. And the motion of that seizure, total resilience, ecstatic refusal to collapse, renders limits, renders coffers, renders hindrance, renders resistance a part of the play. The nesting of what is inside of what might be otherwise is a state of play that which reorients the circumstances of causality, not by avoidance, but via radical embrace, an embrace capable of usurpation, even only if it were not so devoted to pleasure. For pleasure, it must act responsively, correlatively, tending towards the catalytic. 13th century, 13th century Catalan mystic, Ramon Lull, in his idiosyncratic theological treatise, The Book of the Lover and the Beloved, describes the dynamic of the exchange this way. Quote, the beloved asks the lover, do you remember me giving you anything as a reward for wanting to love me? The lover replied, certainly you make no distinction between the travail and the pleasure you gave me, that you give me. But disassembling concepts of reward and exchange as if they were raw material of an adventure playground that one might set into a heap and deem a combination tool, shed, love, shack, uh, 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 shack is of course fantasy. That's what we were calling it. We are calling it what it is, fantasy that is unsustainable. After all, Atali's prediction of emancipation from the tyranny of repetition, from an impulse to communicate, to accumulate the simulacral products of artistic labor, has been upended, though not by play at all or in any way that Atali might have predicted. Even as our habits of listening would seem to have been usurped by the arch capitalist mode of stockpiling material commodities, music is not transcended or snuck past capital. It has become a utility, a series of aggregated streams catering algorithmically to the paradoxically atomized yet homogenous tastes of consumers. But is this liberation from nodding magnetic tape and cracked jewel cases at all comparable to the sort of bodilinessless O experiences when the story leaves off of the elected, of elective abandonment to being a difficult body, neither occupied nor occupying, illogical, irreducible? <clears throat> this is a time of likes, not love. Ironically, we must look to important cont contemporary surges of sonic ag agonism for an antidote. We find this in the work of the queer activist art collective Ultra Red. Take, for example, their 2000 work, Silent Listen. Bringing together survivors of and witnesses to the AIDS epidemic, the piece asks the public to revisit their experiences of the pandemic in a time in which <clears throat> visibility, its visibility has been, been diminished. 
During the public and university auditoriums, museums, public parks, Ultra Red invites its audience to submit statements describing the impact that HIV AIDS has had on their lives, both literally and figuratively, for the record. Looping these recordings in digital processes uh, and digitally processing them in real time, Ultra Red gradually transforms the testimony of its audience into the palimpsests of suffering and survival. As Lauren Berlant notes, Silent Listen treats the record as a, quote, field archive that exists to establish and legitimate norms, but is circulating, sorry, not as a field archive that exists to establish and legitimate norms, but a circulating thing that engenders rhythm. Rather than capture their stories, Ultra Red releases them into immediate circulation within the physical space of, inter of intervention, thereby reforming the record as a, as a vital form of feedback. Instead of documenting, a gesture that is always marked with the will to hoard and retain, Ultra Red redistributes the, the affective energy of its audience, building it into a collective action of mourning and militancy. Um, the work's power lies in its ability to bring into, shared, into being shared structures of feeling, spaces that coax stories out into the open while simultaneously letting them slip away. Ironically, this powerful expression of love lies in the composition of a decomposition that engenders difference and posits intelligibility not as understanding what words mean, but feeling what multiplicities of singularities sound like. This means shying away from the desire to create authentic moments and forms of experience that would cause listeners to clump together in groups whose affiliations were always already, who were already waiting for the moment of identification. When so many of us, weary of the crush of capitalism, are retreating into idealized and nostalgic forms of community, Decentralized groups of 5,040 apiarist collectors of antique milk glass stuck together digitally in Pinterest, there is something promising about a commitment to oral artifice. In a manifesto from the early 2000s, Ultra Red writes, quote, only by artifice can we ever, concept ever conceptualize urban space as distinguishable from its ambiance. Separating sound from context produces the most artificial results, a utopia, so to speak. The artifice we construct gives shape to our own position in public space. In this sense, their vision of utopian politics is sympathetic to the one described by Frederick Jameson. Quote, the fundamental dynamic of any utopian politics, or of any political utopianism, he, um, will always lie in the dialectic of identity and difference, to, that, to the degree to which such a politics aims at, re at imagining, and sometimes even realizing, a system radically different to this one. End quote. Radical difference, not teleological striving. U utopianism does not necessarily have to have a blueprint for the future. If anything, as Paul Ricoeur observes, utopianism has tended to be criticized for its lack of a concrete vision of how change should unfold. Quote, often a utopian vision is treated as a kind of schizophrenic attitude towards society, both a way of escaping the logic of action through a construct outside of history and a form of protection against any verification by concrete action, end quote. Like Jameson, Ricoeur believes that the utopian gesture has a, the power to change what is by making the familiar seem strange. Uh, oh, all right. Okay. Um, I think I've got time. Ra <laughs> Rather than stating a political goal and then agitating for its realization, it is necessary to grant political action in sonic practices that create or actively or activate already latent desire, desires. In this respect, Ultra Red's utopian project is prefigured in Deleuze and Guattari's notion of a minor literature, a vernacular not marked fully by otherness, by its linguistic exclusion from the majority, but in which, quote, a minority constructs uh, within a major language, end quote. A minor literature, we, which we can take to include modes of expression other than text, does not have the luxury of remaining apolitical, unlike its majoritarian counterpart, whose concerns might be uniquely individual, for, the sphere, for, with it, for which the sphere of the social is little more than a backdrop for personal expression. A minor literature is by necessity attached to political action, connected to a collectivity, whether or not consensus exists. A major literature posits its objects in advance. These are known knowns, to paraphrase Donald Rumpelsfeld, uh, whose expression follows content. Art is always, to some extent, political in that it is either engaged in maintaining the dominant order or questioning it. Of course, <clears throat> this plays out at very different registers and with different degrees of intensity. But as Chantal Mouffe writes, quote, there's an aesthetic dimension in the political and there's a political dimension in art, end quote. 
echoing Benjamin's observations on the inextricable link, inextricable link between aesthetics and power, Muth proposes that art can either cement individuals' identification with hegemony, hegemony or it can throw ideology into question. She identifies in the work of some canonical philosophers of public space, thinkers like Arendt and Habermas, a problematic focus on consensus, even if such an accord is arrived at through persuasion, as Arendt suggests. For Muth, a vibrant democracy cannot be brought about through reason alone, as though there exists a model that best addresses the needs and desires of a people. A politics that grasps only at consensus but must necessarily be exclusionary. Better than let an agonistic struggle be the mode of disorganization and an always unfinished project that recognizes reconciliation as being tantamount to hegemony. So what is an agonistic art and how can it intervene in public space? How might art counter hegemony if avant-garde critique has run out of steam on accounts of its continual appropriation by capitalism as Muth and others lament? If public space is the substrate of the liberal consensus-based form of, po of politics, a space that is always striated and hegem hegem hegemonically structured, agonistic art practices do not promote the visions of unity and consensus upon which the state rests. They incite dissensus and call attention to the hegemonic organization of space of politics that would otherwise remain obscure. Agonistic art intervenes in public space not by reflecting concerns back so that they might be grounded, ground into uniformity in the crucible of consensus. They produce new subjectivity and prolif proliferate difference. Counterintuitively, it is an agonism that love flourishes. Love is a process and sounds like a protest. If we really want to love one another, we'll be on guard against sonic affects that beckon us towards unisonance, towards sounding together as one that promises belonging to rather than simply again to quote Agamben, being such for belonging itself. And to end on a, 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 a quote from Agamben, seeing something simply in its being thus irreparable, but not for that reason necessary. Thus, but for that reason contingent is love. At the point you perceive the ir irreparability of the world, at that point it is transcendence. How the world is, this is outside the world. Whatever. Yes. <laughs>